Do you remember where you were the first time you noticed an insect on your plant? Whew, I think this is a moment every plant parent dreams about, has nightmares about, and certainly remembers for the rest of their life, as we fear plant pests on such a visceral level. But it totally makes sense because we have these plants that we love and care for, and then all of a sudden they're under attack. Often we don't see it. We don't see it coming. And we're usually unprepared and totally confused on how to identify these bugs that are invading my plant, and more importantly, how to eradicate those little buggers. But plant friends, all bugs are not created equal. And you might argue that there are even some bugs that are meant to be left alone. But with houseplants, there are a very specific set of insects and arachnids that you don't want anywhere near your plant. And if they do show up for a visit, you better kick it into high gear and kick them out of your house as quick as possible because they can cause a significant amount of damage to our treasured plants and even be the reason for their demise. I have heard horror stories of entire plant collections being wiped out by thrips in the course of a week. I've heard about someone coming home from a vacation with plants covered in spider mite webs. Or like you'll hear in today's interview, my five-year-long relationship with scale, which sometimes I call my first pet. So welcome, plant friends, to an insanely informative but also creepy crawly episode with my beloved plant friend and plant nerd, Leslie Halleck. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Happy 200th episode, plant friends. I cannot believe we're here. I feel particularly special that my dearest plant friend, Leslie Halleck, is the guest for today's 200th episode. But man, if I take a minute to think about it, we are at 200 episodes. We have listeners in more than 50 countries. We have millions of downloads. We have thousands and thousands of you tuning in from all over the world, united by your common passion for plants. When I sit and think about this community a mycorrhizal web of plant friends and plant parents around the world. Our plant collections look different. We look different. We are different. We're in different cultures, yet we're bonded by this passion for plants and our desire for education. Oh my gosh. One of the biggest gifts has been connecting with you guys in the platform and app and getting to see all the different countries that call in and hearing from you all in my DMs and emails, you know, I hope you know, I read every DM. I try and read and respond to every email. This community is so important to me. I could have never in a million bajillion Googleplex fulfilling years, six years ago when I started this podcast in 2017, I could have never imagined that this is what I would be doing full time, that I would not be living in New York City, that I would be living in the woods, growing grow bags full of tomatoes and lettuce and caring for houseplants and helping this community care for plants. I could have never imagined that I would be an author. I could have never imagined that this would even be possible to be a full-time podcaster. And I am that because of you guys. And I'm so thankful. I'm so deeply thankful to this community. 200 episodes is hitting. It's hitting my heart. This is like the biggest honor I've ever had. I really do mean that to be alongside you in your journeys for plant parenthood, but more importantly for wellness. And the fact that these episodes might lift your spirits or help you in your journey is my greatest accomplishment in life. So I'm so honored to be here ushering you through plant parenthood with this 200th episode. And man, oh man, I'm giving you a good one this episode, plant friend. You might be hearing Frankie boy, my little birdie boy in the background. He just got really excited. He heard me talking about my 200th episode and wanted to chime in and say thank you to you guys from his heart because he lives a charmed freaking life (laughs) in the Growing Joy office. Anyway, I'm so excited to have Leslie Halleck as a guest for this episode. Today's episode is so amazing. Plant pests, man, we all hit that moment where we get an infestation and we need help. And today's episode, Leslie and I talk about 
the five or six most common plant pests, how to identify them, and then how to get rid of them. It's such a good episode. You're going to want to save this. You're going to want to come back to this because every time you get a plant infestation, this is going to be the episode that is going to get you out of trouble. Send this episode to all your friends. Everybody needs this episode. If you have a plant, you need this episode because plant pests are part of the deal. It's so good. I love Leslie. She's so amazing. Leslie Halleck, the plant nerd extraordinaire. She's also like my dearest plant friend. So before we dive in, I just want to give a shout out to a couple of new plant friends. On the 200th episode, this feels especially special. Cheryl S., Chelsea M., and Anna P. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy Garden Society. It's my online platform. It's accessible via iOS, Android apps, or your web browser. The intention is to make new plant friends, propagate your knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. It's an international community of our listeners listeners connecting online via this app and you can share tips. You can humble brag about your orchid blooming, whatever you want. We're here for you. If you want to join us, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com. Anyway, back to Leslie. She is such a plant nerd. She's so knowledgeable. She has so many decades in the hort industry with pest management and she brings the heat today. She did not disappoint us for this 200th episode. So without further ado, here is Leslie Halleck and a deep dive on insects and arachnids that can affect our houseplant collection. Welcome back, Leslie. Again, I'm back again. I feel like I'm home, Maria. I'm so excited for you to be here as a repeat guest and so excited. We even made a name for the series, Leslie. Grow better. Grow better. Yeah, you've roped me in to be on regularly. Mostly, again, we just like to find excuses to talk to one another, I think. A hundred percent. Every recording we book means a half an hour on the beginning or the end of the recording (laughs) that we just get to chat. But I love that, you know, you'll be coming back on the show for this Grow Better series where we can really dive into the nitty gritty of the stuff that you really need the science. You need the horticulture. You need the multiple degrees that you have to grow better. You know, we're starting off with we had our kind of general episode last month. This month we're hitting bugs. I think Every plant parent hits that moment in their plant parent journey. They've never had a pest before. They think that they're impenetrable and they get their first bug infestation and they freak out. Yeah, I think we realized in in our episode last month that we just didn't get to hardly any of the topics that we wanted to cover in the hour. So I think, yes, I think doing an ongoing series is going to be a great way to help everyone grow better. They can dig a little deeper into the subjects that they like. And bugs is a subject that I think throws a lot of indoor growers for a loop pretty quickly. And I think when you aren't experienced with indoor growing, be it houseplants or edibles, that first infestation, it seems like it comes out of nowhere, right? And it's so confusing how it even manifested. You know, these plants are inside. My doors are closed. I don't see anything flying around. Where did these critters come from? But the thing to remember is that you are growing in an artificial environment indoors, right? Clearly, the plants that you're growing exist in situ outdoors in nature, in an ecosystem that is hopefully balanced, right, for their needs and their success, take them out of that, put them in a pot, bring them into an artificial environment. And all of a sudden you have created conditions that could possibly be much more conducive for a particular bug, insect, or arachnid that likes to feed on your plants to all of a sudden get out of control because things are no longer in equilibrium like they are out in nature. The predators aren't there. The temperature swings aren't there. The things that would naturally control particular pests from getting out of control don't exist indoors. And sometimes the conditions you have create like the perfect baby incubator, you know, for certain pests. And so, you know, me, I'm always going to talk about the environment You know, when we talk about plant care and and in this case, uh, critters, bugs, pests. So yeah, that's, that's not a sign of failure. I think I want to make that clear. Everyone who grows indoors is at some point experiencing an infestation. We can talk about how that starts. Wherever you want to start with that is good, but it happens to all of us, me included. 
Yes, 100% actively eradicating white flies in my Hoya collection in my office right now. So I'm there with you, plant friends. So, you know, you kind of already started answering the first question I had written down to ask you. Let's dive deeper there. So why do plants get pests? You mentioned that you might get hitchhikers that are already in the soil or already, you know, invisible bugs, insects on the leaves. What are the different scenarios that are going to set your plant up for getting a aphid outbreak, fungus gnat outbreak, spider mite outbreak? Yeah. So I think the hitchhikers is a good point. I think obviously we bring plants home from the garden center, the plant shop, right? Wherever it is that we're getting them from a friend, right? Or we're babysitting somebody's plants and we bring those new plants into our home and they could very well be bringing along with them adults or eggs or larva of whatever happened to lay eggs, you know, or pupate or whatever it is on that plant or in the growing media, wherever it was growing before. And I, I do want to say, I see a lot online and on social media, a lot of kind of animosity towards growers and retailers in regards to this issue. And I want to make sure everybody understands that plants can go through many steps and many growers by the time they get to you and you buy them and take them home. It could be the, you know, they maybe are a result of tissue culture or cuttings that have to be taken. And then that's a plug producer. And then that plug producer sells those plugs to somebody who does intermediate finishing, right? They may grow those to a four inch. And then that four inch might go to another grower to get finished off into a six or eight inch pot. And then it goes, you know, maybe to a broker and then it goes to a retailer. So there are many stops along the way (laughs) that plants can pick up pests. And just because you've bought a plant that may have had some invisible hitchhikers on it doesn't mean that that retailer wasn't intentionally doing a bad job or trying to, to do you a disservice. Not to say that there aren't a lot of newer growers and retailers out there that may not be as educated about how to manage pests in their environment, but long-term experience growers typically have a pretty established IPM, Integrated Pest Management System, in play, and they really do their best to try to catch every little thing before it gets to you. But that's not, it's never 100% possible unless you're really using a lot of heavy duty systemic insecticides. And even then, sometimes those can't hit things like thrips. So no matter how good a quality it is and how good a quality of grower, these things are going to happen. So paying attention and scouting the plants before you bring them into your home is always a great first step. So yeah, there could be eggs, there could be larvae, there could be things that from the time that you took it from the garden center to home that could have latched on. You never know. So certainly you can bring things into the home that are infested before you ever start to grow them. What about plants as vectors? I've heard that word used before. Well, so normally when you're talking about vectors, you're talking about, for example, a virus or a bacterial infection. So fungal diseases have spores that can exist outside of the plant. And then when that spore activates on that plant. Fungi have structures called hyphae that they can actually use to puncture and enter the plant. Like a virus, for example, needs a vector. It can't live outside of a host. So there's typically an insect vector. So an insect will carry the virus and then when it starts to feed on the plant, it transmits the virus to the plant. So a plant could become a vector if it's infected And an insect feeds on it, picks up a virus, and then goes and passes it to another plant. So usually when you hear the term vector, we're usually referring to the insect or arachnid or whatever it is that feeds on the plant that then may be transmitting something like a virus to your plant. Okay. And then what about the scenario that I've heard people, you know, they've had a plant for a long time. They overwater it and it bursts into fungus gnats, or they've had a plant for years and all of a sudden it has spider mites. So it's not that hitchhiker scenario. I know this is a crazy question, but like, can these bugs materialize out of thin air or it all it has to do is be one open window that, you know, these small bugs get through and then lands and multiplies? Like, what about those infestations you hear about multiple years in? Yes. If you 
look in my book, Gardening Under Lights. I think I have a picture in there of peppers with aphids on them. And I'll grow peppers in the winter inside grow tents in my garage. Uh, I don't get aphids on peppers outdoors because outdoors in Texas, you know, it's 100 plus degrees outside and dry in the summer months when peppers are growing. And that is not an environmental situation that's conducive to aphids. Aphids like cooler temperatures and high humidity. Well, what do I have when I'm growing inside in the winter inside those grow tents? (laughs) I have the perfect conditions for aphids in the middle of winter. And those plants are isolated Mm. in my grow tents in my garage. And yet what do I end up with? An aphid outbreak. So those eggs have to be present somewhere or they float in. I open that garage door, an adult happens to fly in, get inside the grow tent. And so this is what's going to happen in your home. So let's say that you truly have a plant that has no, there's no eggs, there's no adults. It's a completely sterile potting mix, right? There's nothing on this plant. Sure. All it takes is you opening the door having an open window, right? Critters come in, they land on your plant, they start laying eggs or they start feeding on the plant. Yeah. So we really aren't, no one is safe. (laughs) And that's why this is part of life. And we just need to arm ourselves with good information on when it happens, how to deal with it. It's a when, not an if. Yeah. And that's why, you know, tissue culture is a a a sterilized, controlled propagation method that's used a lot of the time specifically for plant varieties or cultivars that are susceptible to having persistent, you know, viruses, right? It's a way to minimize that, right? By having clean culture, tissue culturing a virus-free plant. And then, you know, that's done in a very controlled, tight environment, you know, so that you don't spread that. Because same thing, if you happen to bring a plant in that maybe has some spores on it, of a fungal disease or something, you're not going to see. And then you start doing something like overwatering, or maybe the humidity is high in your home, or you start misting onto the foliage of those plants. What are you doing? You are cultivating that fungus now and spreading it to other nearby plants, potentially. Okay. So say I suspect... Well, I guess chicken or the egg, either I suspect I have a pest outbreak or how do I know I have a pest outbreak? So what are the symptoms that we should be looking for? And, you know, regularly, I say, you know, as part of your plant care, self-care routine, you should be regularly inspecting your plant's leaves, the undersides of your leaves, because it's better to catch an infestation early and eradicate it than wait until it's too late and then you've got to pitch your plant. So what are the symptoms we should be looking for? So we'll kind of go through, do you want to start with like fungus gnats? We'll kind of go through your top five. Yeah, sure. You know, and you know, I'm going to say it depends because there are often, it can be tricky to go by symptomology alone for insects and diseases because many times cultural habits are also at play, right? So some of the same symptoms that I'm going to talk about with some of these bugs, right, could also look very similar to underwatering or overwatering or low humidity. So you really do have to get to know your plants. So fungus gnats, the adults that fly around, they look like little gnats. They're not doing anything to your plants. They're not feeding on your plants, but what they are doing is laying their eggs in the soil and your growing media, the larva hatch, and then they start to feed on your plant roots, especially if the population gets too far out of control. A few here and there isn't going to hurt anything, but when the population starts to get bigger, then they really start putting a dent in those root hairs. So think about a plant's ability to uptake water and nutrients when it starts losing a bunch of its root hairs, right? So you're probably going to start seeing symptoms overall general decline. You may start to see some wilting. You may start to see some overall discoloration. It kind of stops growing. It's going to be one of those things that's kind of hard to tell exactly what's wrong with it. It just doesn't look very happy. And a lot of times what's going on under the soil is that you're losing root tissue, I also do feel like fungus gnats are probably the easiest to identify in terms of when you have fungus gnats, you know, those buggers are flying around. They're like in your ear. (laughs) I feel like there's that funny like houseplant meme of, you know, you're always just like trying to clap at a fungus gnat flying around. 
Yeah, I think the thing I find with early beginners is that they don't necessarily make the connection between the gnats that are flying around and the lack of vigor on their plants. So yes, if you have adult gnats flying around and you have a plant that just doesn't seem to be right, it's kind of stunted or, you know, you essentially could really start overwatering it as a consequence of that plant not having enough root tissue anymore, right? So maybe you weren't overwatering it before, but now all of a sudden you're having overwatering symptoms. So that's something to look at. Thank you so much to today's episode, Espoma Organic. You know plant friends. If you've listened to this podcast, you know they're a longtime plant friend of the show. Espoma is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. And plant friends, we are deep into the growing season, which means it's time to talk about feeding. We know I love Espoma Organics line of potting mixes. Obviously, all my houseplants are in their potting mix. All of my grow bags are in their potting mix using also their composts. But I'm super thankful this time of the year for their line of fertilizers and plant foods because if you're growing food, particularly that are heavy feeders like tomatoes, you need to be fertilizing your plants this summer. They have a type of fertilizer for every type of plant parent. They have the liquid fertilizer and the granular fertilizer. If you're a liquid fertilizer plant parent, they've made it stupidly easy. (laughs) They've got a fertilizer for whatever you're growing. The cap that the fertilizer comes with is the measuring cap. You just measure the liquid fertilizer and then dump it in your watering can, pour and go. It's so easy. Particularly their indoor plant food liquid fertilizer is what I use on my house plants. It's so easy. You literally just pour it into your watering can. It's a very gentle fertilizer. So I use it all summer. Every time I water, I just pour a little bit in my watering can. It's amazing. But let's talk about our gardens. Let's talk about outdoors. If you're growing tomatoes, if you're growing vegetables. You got to check out their granular fertilizers. Espoma is known for their line of tones. Their line of tones, their plant fertilizers have been around for over 80 years. They're packed with natural proteins and beneficial microbes. Your plants will thank you for the strong roots, the deep green foliage and big blooms and harvests that the tone will support. The tones are filled with long-lasting organic ingredients that break down slowly every time you water them, which is important. They've got a tone specifically designed for whatever you are growing, from garden tone to berry tone to rose tone to azalea tone, bulb tone, flower tone, and of course, my favorite tomato tone, which I put on my tomatoes. Whatever you're growing, indoor or outdoors, plant friends, Espoma Organic has a thoughtfully made amazing product to keep your plants growing, whether they're your house plants or your garden. To learn more about all of their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can check out my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my Espoma favorites. Espoma Organics, thanks again. Espoma Organics has your potting mix and fertilizer solutions. Soltech Grow Light lovers, get ready for a major announcement courtesy of our sponsor, Soltech, for their all new LED Grow Bar Light. Woo, I'm so excited. Soltech, my beloved Grow Light company, has just launched a new product, a bar light that is going to transform so many areas of your space into highlight havens for your plants. It is time to invite the beauty of nature into your home like never before, introducing the Grove, Soltech's all-new LED bar light designed to grow everywhere in style. Say goodbye to dark corners and hello to vibrant and thriving interiors from your kitchen herb garden to your stylish plant shelves. With The Grove, versatility is the name of the game. You can illuminate your space with ease, whether it's under shelves, on walls, or inside your growing cabinets. Hello, Ikea Grow Cabinet plant friends. The Grove is your new solution. With its full spectrum glow, The Grove provides plants with the perfect balance of light they need to flourish. Soltech's warm color temperature ensures your plants can bask in the sun all day. No more settling for subpar lights that die quickly. The Grove not only delivers optimal performance, but it's built to last. You can enjoy nature's beauty for years to come. You're covered with a 90-day money-back guarantee, so try it and see if you like it. And you get free shipping, and the Grove comes with a five-year warranty, ensuring it will last longer than most plant trends. Show me another grow light that gives you a five-year warranty. Plant friends, are you ready? Are you ready to give your plants the light they deserve 
and turn your bookshelf into a grow shelf. Don't miss out. The initial supplies are limited. Visit soltech.com today and use code BLOOM15 to unlock a 15% listener discount on your purchase. Be one of the first people to get Soltech's new grow bar called The Grove. Go to soltech.com and use BLOOM15 to unlock a 15% listener discount. Soltech, transforming spaces and making lives brighter. All right, so let's keep running with this fungus gnats because I do feel like, I mean, I think they're the most popular bug that I get written about because I just feel like, you know, you overwater your plant once and you're getting fungus gnats. So we know how to identify them. We know what they're doing. What do you suggest? I also feel like I see so many things on the internet about how to cleanse fungus gnats, sprinkling cinnamon on your soil, you know, watering your plant with hydrogen peroxide, like pure hydrogen peroxide, letting the plant dry out completely. But like some people let them dry out too much. There's a lot of fake news about fungus gnats. So what's your professional opinion on how to deal with them? Yeah, you'll often see, well, if you overwater your plant, you're going to get fungus gnats. And I want to clarify that overwatering in itself does not lead to fungus gnats. There have to be adult fungus gnats present to lay eggs, right, in the soil first, or you will never get fungus gnats even if you overwatered. So it's not a one plus one equals two situation. You do have to have adults present in order. So overwatering itself, but fungus gnat larvae, thrive in moist soil and also organic matter in the soil. So if you happen to have some organic matter in your potting soil or a bunch of worm castings or composted manures and things like that, that creates very fertile ground for fungus gnat larvae to thrive. So if you find that you have trouble with fungus gnats on a regular basis, then you're best going with a completely inert potting mix versus something that has organic matter in it. So number one, you can dial back that problem by reducing the organic matter that you have in your indoor potting soil. Air circulation, it does help because it keeps the adults from landing on the top of the soil. So that's an environmental thing that you want to use. Sticky traps are a professional go-to. Always use sticky traps because what you want to do is basically nullify the adult population. As long as you have adults, you're going to keep getting eggs and you're going to keep getting larvae. So using the sticky traps will help you get rid of a lot of the adults. There are some barriers, kind of like porous rock, that you can use on the surface of the potting mix that can potentially block the adults from getting to the growing media and laying eggs, but I still don't find they're 100% effective. My best solution, and I've used everything. You can use some BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacteria, soil-borne bacteria that disrupts the gut function of larvae when they consume it. So you can water some BT, liquid BT or thuricide into the soil. But I often find that using hydrogen peroxide, diluted hydrogen peroxide, and what I use is a 10% mix, meaning you get that 3% hydrogen peroxide from the grocery store, right? And that's going to be at 3%. And I use one part of that to 10 parts water. That's all it takes. You don't need to be pouring pure hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. You can damage (laughs) tissue that way, just like it damages human tissue, Interestingly, hydrogen peroxide, grandma would always pour that on wounds, right? But that's actually been shown it can damage tissue. So you want to dilute that. So I use a 10% mix, right? Or a one to 10 ratio, one part of the 3% hydrogen peroxide to 10 parts water. And that, I'll tell you, is usually the fastest knockout for me. Mm. So you're doing the sticky traps to deal with the above soil issue of the adults. And then you're watering with a 10% one to 10 solution of hydrogen peroxide to get the babies and the larvae that are wreaking havoc on the roots. What about letting the pot dry out after you water with the hydrogen? Do you think that's required or just keep watering as normal? Keeping the growing media overly moist is just an environmental condition that's conducive to their reproduction. So yes, letting it dry out. You don't want to let that pot dry out and then do a hydrogen peroxide drench. There should be some moisture in the growing media when you apply that, just like when you put in fertilizers, just like when you put in another, any other soil drench. You need there to be some moisture in the growing media so that you don't cause problems in that rhizosphere, you know, the around the root tissue. So yes, you can also let plants dry. So if you have a persistent problem, it could be you're leaving pots a little too wet along with the fact that there's probably some organic matter in your growing media. 
which is what they feed on. And then additionally, we'll start to feed on plant roots. Okay, got it. All right. So fungus gnats, that's your tried and true solution. I feel like a lot of people listening are going to be really relieved to hear that. Another plant insect that I feel like is devastating when you get, because it can really wreak true ham, you know, fungus gnats. It's going to take fungus gnats a long time to kill your plants. Spider mites is a infestation that no one wants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are worse things than spider mites, I will say. We'll, okay. We'll get to that. But um, yeah, spider mites, teeny tiny arachnids. They're actually little little spiders, uh, little mites that can kind of be reddish or brown, pale, and they will typically pop up. And I will say kind of pop up because while they don't manifest overnight, it can kind of seem that way for you yeah. on the undersides of leaves and stems. And what you'll typically see is a fine webbing. And when you suspect you may have a spider mite infestation, you will notice kind of a mottled, pale or yellow, speckled casting to the leaf. You may have some leaf curling, you may have some leaf dropping, or you might see like tiny pinprick holes in the leaves. I often find that people don't really notice it until it's a pretty intense infestation. They can move pretty fast mm -hmm. once they get established. I typically find that spider mites, spider mites, opposite of aphids, like it warm and dry. So when your home environment gets very dry from a humidity perspective, and maybe your plant is drying out more often, that kind of creates the perfect environment for spider mites to blow out of proportion. Mm, that's why winter, when you've got the forced heat, interesting. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So plants that, you know, maybe like a little bit more humidity can be then become more susceptible to spider mites when things are very dry and warm. So, and know that those leaves are not going to recover. That is a question I get is that if I leave the leaves that were damaged on there, are they going to recover? And that's a no. Because the mites have sucked they're feeding on the leaf, right? They're like sucking. Su what are they sucking out of the leaf? Yes. Water, nutrients, right? And then you have desiccation of those plant cells and then you have necrosis, okay. right? Which is, cell de is death, right? So that tissue dies. It's not going to regenerate. Okay. So yeah, I feel like because also spider mites are little. So sometimes you see the webbing before you see the bugs because yes. they're so small. It's not like a fungus gnat that you see flying around to your naked Correct. eye as easily. Correct. So I do also want to bring up one of my favorite tools I have ever purchased per your recommendation <laughs> is a handheld microscope that has yeah. a lens that at mm -hmm. the end of the lens has a switch with that has a light. And I yes. have used this thing so many times, Leslie, and it's so affordable. I think it's under $20 on, on Amazon. I'll put the link in the show notes. But for smaller bugs like this, it has saved me. It has really helped me identify stuff because also with bugs, once you know you have the outbreak, then you really have to go look at the body of the bug to identify it. Like when I had my whitefly outbreak, I couldn't figure out if they were spider mites or thrips or mealybugs. And the only way I could really do that was through using my lens. Yes, that's very important because when you start to do things like use insecticides, not every insecticide is labeled for every insect or mite. Mm -hmm. So not everything is going to work as a broad spectrum. BT, for example, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis or thuricide is specific to caterpillars. Larva, it's not going to work on spider mites, right? It's not going to work on aphids. It's not going to work, right? So you have to make sure you know what the pest is that you're treating before you choose a product that you're going to use on it, right? Because not everything is effective. Mites in particular are resistant to a lot of insecticides. So you go out and you buy something that's just general broad spectrum and you think it's going to work and then, you know, you still have the pest. So yes, a little hand lens and it makes you feel like a super cool little botanist too. You know, it's one of those tools that, right. And then you can take it out in nature and look at insects. So knowing whether you have something like a mealybug or a spider mite or a thrips is an important distinction. So getting a close up look is a good idea. Okay, so once we've figured out, and spider mites, to your eye, what, how would you describe what spider mites look like? They're tiny arachnids. They look like teeny tiny 
little crabs, little spiders <laughs> is exactly what they look like. And they could be red or red brown, mm-hmm. pale colored. So there's some different coloration var- variations, just like in aphids. Okay. And so how am I, I've identified my spider mite with my lens. We know that I've got these little baby spiders crawling around my precious Hoya or my precious Anthurium or, you know, whatever it's infesting. How do we get rid of these suckers? So this is the one situation where I'm going to tell you, you might want to go ahead and mist around this plant. Otherwise, you know, I tell you don't mist onto plant foliage, period. But if you are having persistent problems with spider mites, then using a humidifier around your plants or actually just doing some misting of water up on that foliage under the foliage and on the stems, they do not like that. That is not conducive to their life cycle. So that's one thing you can do. Of course, any natural product that sort of smothers, okay, insecticidal or horticultural oils, insecticidal soaps. Like a neem oil? Yes, like a neem. Now there are neem metabolite extracts that are stomach poisons that have to be ingested. So it has to be an insect that's going to feed on the plant. Or you have a neem oil, which will act like a horticultural oil, which smothers, breaks down tissue or disrupts egg cycles. Okay. So you have to read the label. Because you want the latter? You could do either. It depends on what you're treating. For spider mites. So for spider mites, you need to choose an insecticide that actually says that it treats spider mites on the label. There are a number of different products but not all of them will work on mites. Mites can be particularly difficult. So you need a miticide. It's essentially what you're looking for. So whatever it is that you buy, whether it's an insecticidal soap or horticultural oil or spinosad or a biopesticide, it needs to be labeled specifically for spider mites. If it does not say spider mites on the label, don't use it. Look for something that does say spider mites. Love it. Spider mites, it sounds like, are best treated by smothering, like spraying something on top of them and not eating something that kills them. Or they can have... Most of the time you're looking at, yeah, doing some contact kill and suppressing reproduction. So some of the oils will also prevent eggs from properly hatching. Got it. And then also some of the new biopesticides both bacterial and fungal, some of the bacterial biopesticides do have some efficacy on spider mites as well. So some of the new biopesticides will are heat-killed bacteria that produces extracts that's then fermented, and then that disrupts the reproductive cycles of some of these insects. It can also be ingested. So no matter what you're using, you want to make sure that it's a miticide that's labeled for um, spider mites. And then you are going to need to retreat, usually with any of these type of, of insects or, or little arachnids like spider mites. Seven to 10 day intervals is generally what you're looking at. Do you recommend also like putting them under your faucet with your spray gun or something and like trying to knock the bugs off with force from your... Yes. I am all for physical removal. The problem is, is that I can't always talk everybody into doing the squishing or the Mm -hmm. (laughs) physical removal. I am mostly organic, but I'm not stupid. That's how you kind of like, I try to do things naturally. I try to do things organically. Essentially, what I'm looking to do is lowest impact first. Mm -hmm. There are situations where you're not going to be able to solve a horticultural problem necessarily unless you use something a little stronger, but you don't need to go to the stronger treatment first. So yes, if you have the ability to take that plant outside or you have a deep kitchen sink that you can set it in and you have a spray faucet, ideally I'd like you to take it outside because if you've got flying insects of any kind and you're hosing it off in the kitchen sink, you know, those adults will go elsewhere. Right. So if you can take it outside on your patio or balcony or yard, get the spray hose out, put it on shower at a good pressure and hose that baby off. Clean that plant, wash it, hose it down. And that will get rid of a lot of the adult insects and some of the eggs potentially too. That will help you cut down the initial infestation that you have to then treat. But you're still going to want to probably treat it after you do that. Yeah, I feel like I've done before. I mean, when I was in New York City and I didn't have an outside space, I would put them in my tub, but I didn't keep plants in my bathroom and I would rinse them down and then I would spray them with the horticultural spray because then you're kind of, it's like a one-two punch. You're going to try and get as many off and then you're going to spray the ones that remain. 
Right. Because things like insecticidal soaps, like for example, they kill through suffocation, right? And they'll disrupt kind of the cellular membrane or that waxy coating that covers the insect and then they dehydrate. And then oils basically kind of do the same thing. They coat it, they plug them up, they actually disrupt the um, viability of eggs and hatching. And so they can basically just slow down the reproductive cycle to the point where you can manage it or eradicate it. So those types of broad spectrum contact killers can kill a lot of things. It's just that certain pests can be more difficult to really control that way. So you just have to know what you're dealing with. Okay. Let's talk about the cutest bug of them all. (laughs) The roly poly, the little white cotton ball, the mealy bug. When you look at it up close, it's the cutest. I mean, it's not, it's also kind of the grossest, but, um, you know, mealy bug, little roly poly, cutie white guys are kind of cute. Yeah. Not, not to be confused with garden roly polies. Absolutely. Not to be confused, which are good, beneficial. And those are, you know, in the crustacean uh, family. And they have gills. Did you know that? Little roly polies actually have gills. I didn't know that. That's incredible. Like crustaceans do. But that's an outdoor garden topic. Not that you can't have them inside if you bring your pots inside in the summer, but mealybugs, yeah. And there's lots of different species of mealybugs. Many of them are cute. Some of them are very gross. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I do feel like mealybugs are another common, common houseplant pest. So talk to us about mealybugs. Why do they show up? How do we get rid of them? Same thing. Obviously, you've got some hitchhikers or you've got some eggs. They can crop up kind of any time the plant is stressed. And I will say that, that that is the case for any any of these plants. So when environmental conditions are not conducive for that plant happiness, it creates stress and it just makes them an easier, easier prey, essentially, because that's what nature is going to call the weak. Right. Insects, I mean, that feed on plants and plant tissue and detritus, they're doing their job. They're breaking down organic tissue so that it can be recycled. And when something is not vigorous and healthy, it's easier to break down. Right. So when a plant is stressed, that's often when it's easier for an infestation to blow up. Yeah. So mealybugs, you will often see some sort of yellowing and curling of the leaf. They also produce a sticky honeydew like aphids. So you'll notice kind of some maybe some sticky, shiny gunky stuff on your leaves. And if you then look at the plant and check the leaf axis or crotch, you know, where your petiole meets the stem and you see some fuzzy white stuff in there, you've got mealybugs. And the fuzzy white stuff is the bug. So these are bugs that you, that are large enough that you can see them with your eye. I feel like that's a big difference. And they can jump. Yeah. Spooky. (laughs) They can jump. And so they will run from you. And what do they do to our plants? Like, why do we need to be worried about them? Well, they they feed on them. They suck out water and nutrients. Yeah, just like aphids, right? And spider mites. Yes. So they will suck your plant dry. So yeah, so you'll see that yellowing and curling and potential leaf drop, a sticky honeydew, white fuzz. Again, your first best defense is physical removal. You put on those gloves and do some squishing. Or you take that plant outside and you hose it down. But you're going to have to get into the leaf axis, right? They will wedge themselves down. And the little babies can be hard to see. They'll be kind of in the where the new buds are just coming out, which are still very tight. So sometimes you can't really see them. So you have to kind of look close because they like to tuck themselves into all the nooks and crannies. Yeah, they like to get cozy, especially if you have like a Hoya Carnosa Compacta. If you've got plants that have like rippled leaves, I feel like that's that is a nightmare. Insecticidal soaps, Mm -hmm. horticultural oils, spinosad. Sometimes people will ask me about predatory insects. And of course, indoors, managing predatory insects can be a little challenging. Maybe if you're growing in grow tents, that's an easier thing to manage. But if you're growing in an open apartment or open home, then, you know, predatory insects might, you know, may or may may not work for you. In the case of mealybugs, and then, you know, maybe we talk about scale. If you have a really bad problem that's persistent, you know, this might be a situation, you know, a rare situation where I might suggest a systemic pesticide. Yeah. Tell me more about systemics. So I'm not... A huge fan of systemics in the garden or outside because now you have potential persistent effects that can then impact your other wildlife and your insects and your pollinators, right? But on indoor houseplants that are, you're not going to eat, you don't really want to use a systemic on something that you're going to harvest and eat like your lettuce plants. 
but on house plants that live inside and are going to be outside and are going to be, you know, fed on and pollinated by outdoor wildlife, then, you know, a systemic, oftentimes they'll come as a systemic miticide, fungicide product. So, you know, if you find yourself with very persistent problems like mealybugs or, or scale, then a systemic insecticide could be in order. But that's my last line of, of action. And just to be clear for people who don't know, because I didn't know what systemic was until yeah. I texted you and you told me. So systemic is similar to like of granular fertilizer. It's granules that you put on top of your soil. And when you water, the water picks up the pesticide that gets watered into the soil. Your plant absorbs it in the roots and it actually turns your plant toxic. So then when the scale or the mealybug or whatever is feeding off of your plant goes to eat the plant they're eating, it kills them, right? That's what a systemic is, right? They're not just granular though. You can, they're liquid or granular. Oh, got it. Okay, cool. That just get watered in to the root zone of the plant, get absorbed into the plant tissue, travels through the vascular system into the plant cells, the insects or, or mites feed on that tissue, consume the chemical, knocks them out. Yeah. And to speak very freely, I had this white fly outbreak on my Hoyas. I did the method that we've discussed. I took them, I washed them, I sprayed them. I did everything I could. The infestation was too intense. They kept coming back. So I did end up using a systemic and it worked great. So I do feel like it is a good option for when you've, you know, you've tried, you've exhausted your other options and, you know, you really just got to bring in the big guns. Yeah. And if it's not something that's going to be outside, it's not going to have an impact. You're not putting any of that chemical into the environment. You know, I I have very kind of strict parameters around, you know, how I use something like that. And it's very rare for me, you know, but there are times, you know, if you have a greenhouse or something like that in off season when, you know, it's not conducive outside for those insects, but now you've created this worm incubator in a greenhouse, you know, you can have explosions of things like scale and mealybugs and white flies, and it can be almost impossible to eradicate sometimes with things like insecticidal soap or horticultural oils. So, you know, there are moments where, you know, one may resort to something stronger, but I usually am going to say, let that be the last treatment that you use, right? But you also may try, you know, some of the newer biopesticides have promise on things like mites and mealybugs and white flies and thrips even. So, you know, that's something to try too. You know, if you've done the insecticidal soap, you've done horticultural oil, maybe you've tried spinosad, it's still not working. I might try one of the biopesticides. There's some out there that have a species of Burkholderia bacteria in them. So you might try that. And then if that doesn't work and it's just a really bad persistent infestation, then you may go to an insecticide slash miticide systemic that you water into the plant or it's granules and you water those in. I feel like this is the perfect time to switch to my most common pest bugger that I get. I feel like scale was my first pet. If, you know, now Frankie's my (laughs) real pet, but I feel like I have been just taking care of scale and like, I feel like I have just had a persistent scale on something in my, you know, it's always low grade. It's never like really bad, but I feel like no matter what I do, I'm just always going to have scale on some houseplant. They move. It's never the same houseplant. But I don't know why. Scale's my first real pet. And I do feel like, although it's probably one of the least harmful bugs of all of these that we're talking about, man, is it persistent because of that shell. So obviously, you know, it's a very similar treatment to mealybugs. But can you talk a little bit about scale and what it is and what it does? Yeah, I would disagree with you that scale is not a nasty bugger. Um, Scale can be very detrimental. And once they get a hold, it's, they can be very difficult to treat. So, you know, plants like citrus, man, citrus indoors, it can be really tough to keep them scale free because scale love citrus. I think that's limey is who I got scale. And now my freaking whole, we've been talking about my scale for years, Leslie. A long time. <laughs> and they really do. So they have a, a juvenile crawler phase where they don't have that scale and they look like little tiny, like kind of like a spider mate almost. And they're running around and then they pick a spot, they hunker down, they dig in, and then they grow that hard shell. Well, there are soft bodied scales too and hard bodied shell, but the hard shell, like cottony shells are, are easier, but the hard shells are really tough to treat. They're very resistant to any topical treatment. 
you almost have to use a systemic. I what you'll see with scale, oftentimes you you won't notice the scale insects themselves because they will blend in right along those stems and you kind of don't notice it, but your plant will have stunted growth. It starts to look weak, kind of the leaves will start to kind of yellow and shrivel and maybe start to drop off. But then usually the thing that people notice is the sticky honeydew or sooty mold growing on the honeydew on the plants. And they're like, oh my gosh, I have a fungal disease. Really what you have is a scale infestation. Mm. And the sooty mold has said, oh, yay, there's a food source for me to grow on. Thank you for making that honeydew for me. And now I can grow on here too. And now I can block all the light to your leaves so the plant can't photosynthesize. And now you've got a double whammy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's very common with scale. Any insects that produce honeydew, like aphids or scale, you then often have secondary fungal infections because stuff likes to grow on that honeydew. It's sugar. It's a food source. So scale, again, is a physical removal, but a water blast ain't going to do it for most scale, for hard shell scale. So this is where things get a little gross. I put on the gloves and I start stripping those stems and squishing (laughs) and do physical removal. As much of that as you can do initially, the better. Hose that plant down. And then you can try, you know, something like a neem insecticide or neem oil insecticidal soaps, you don't do much in my experience. If you have the hard shell scale, you know, at that point, it may be going to a systemic to deal with that. But then again, if you're growing something like citrus, then you should not be harvesting and eating that fruit if you actually get fruit. Now, chances are on a plant that's got a heavy scale infestation, you're not getting anything. Yeah. It's a man, oh man. Yeah, I know. Limey. Limey gave me that scale. Now my Rafi has it. But, um, I will say there is something very meditative about the scale removal. Like when there's a stem covered in scale and you just wipe the scale away and then you see on the paper towel or for me, I like I make like a 10 percent hydrogen peroxide mix and then I wipe it away with like a white cotton ball. Oh, yeah. That's like a very rewarding experience. <laughs> yes. It's one of those things that like so gross, but you can't look away yes. sometimes. And I want to mention you're kind of saying like things like hydrogen peroxide or maybe alcohol. Mealybugs, you'll see a lot of recommendations of wiping the mealybugs with alcohol, you know, or scale with alcohol. You want to just be careful that you're not just spraying alcohol on your plant foliage or that you're getting a bunch of alcohol on the plant tissue because that can damage and simply just dotting a bunch of these insects with alcohol is really not going to solve your infestation. You really need to get them off the plant. Good clarification. So yeah, better to try to do more physical removal first. Now scale in its juvenile crawler stage is much easier to treat and kill with the things like insecticidal soap and horticultural oils. It's just that they're so tiny. You don't realize they're there outdoors horticulturists like myself, when we are, you know, managing trees and shrubs and and properties or in our own gardens, we'll typically do a horticultural oil application or what used to be called dormant oil, kind of made of different things, in very late winter, early spring when temperatures are just right, because that's the point in time where you can really knock out overwintering pests like white flies, young like white flies, scale crawlers before they grow their shells. So You may hear reference to things like dormant oils or horticultural oils getting put out at that time of year. And that's exactly what they're getting used for. They're they're knocking out these overwintered pests before they blow up and become very hard to treat. Okay, got it. So mealybugs, that scale. What about thrips? Ooh, thrips are sort of every professional greenhouse grower's nightmare. Right. Yes, because... They have been so resistant to chemical treatment up to this point, and they're very, very tiny, and they like to get into new flower buds and leaf buds, and you don't even know they're there until you start to see distortion, right? The plants will sort of kind of get a yellow cast. New leaf buds or new flower buds kind of will look twisted or deformed or discolored, Thrips can also spread different viruses and fungal diseases. So they're an important vector pest as well. So they cause all sorts of problems. And on houseplants in particular, 
things like Monstera deliciosa, any of your aeroids, if they're inside in dry, very low humidity situations, that's a good opportunity. If you let them dry out for too long, right? That's an opportunity for thrips. They'll come in on the air. The adults are winged. They're tiny winged and they fly so they can spread all over the place. Just open that door and in they come. The wingless larvae are what will cluster together in the crevasses of your flower petals and leaves. And when that population gets really overblown, they'll just be right out there on the leaf. I remember I have a Monstera Deliciosa that would sit in my art room at home and I'm a professional horticulturist, so I barely water my plants. <laughs> this, this is the thing yeah. that all of you must know about us professionals is that we're highly abusive of our plants. We're so busy helping everybody else that our plants tend to get neglected. And I sort of knew, I could see that it was sort of getting a cast to it that was off. It was sort of starting to kind of yellowish a little bit. And and one day so I said, okay, I need to go look at this plant. And I, I went over and looked and the whole surface of the monstera leaf was covered with thrips. Normally they're not that easy to see, but this population had exploded really quickly. Oh, no. and because the, plant, the plant wasn't very big. So there weren't a lot of new leaves for it to feed on. So it had just spread onto the adult leaves and started feeding on the adult leaves. So that was like, okay, outside we go. Sticky traps like your fungus nets, because the adults are, are winged and they fly, sticky traps are very helpful to you. And that's often the only and first way that you'll know you have thrips is by seeing them on your sticky trap. So you get that sticky trap and you get out your little magnifying glass and you look at what you're trapping on your sticky trap. And that's a great way for you to scout for specific things. You can try horticultural oils, but of course it's very difficult to reach them by anything that's a topical killer or a suffocator right? When they're tucked down into those buds. I don't, spinosa possibly, but again, they have to come in contact with it and consume it. The biopesticides, there are certain miticides that are labeled for thrips. Some of them are only commercially available. Some are not available for the home grower. Um, but some of the, bi the new biopesticides are showing some efficacy on thrips. So there are biopesticides out there that you can buy. So that would be something for you to try as well. But same thing, take it outside, hose it down. And, you know, I will say, if weather permits, nature is a really great insecticide. Taking that plant and setting it outside for a couple of weeks <laughs> can take care of a lot of your pests because you have predatory insects outside now. Okay, wait. So thrips, are they spinning webs as well or no? No. Okay. You're not going to see webs. You're, the thing you're going to see is that discoloration and deformities on your leaf tissue, flower buds, things just start to get twisted. So I get, I get a lot of pictures sent to me of, for example, you know, a philodendron leaf that won't unfurl mm. out of its bud, right? There's two things that are usually going to be at play there. Usually it's low humidity. So if you have an aeroid that has a, a rolled up leaf and it's just not unfurling, right? You can't, it's just not unfurling and it's getting curly and it's not moving. Usually increasing humidity or putting it in a spot with slightly higher humidity will help it unstick, if you will, and unfurl. But the other thing it could be are thrips. So anytime you have a bud like that, that is kind of getting wonky or curly or tight and isn't unfurling right, Get in there with your magnifying glass and just pull back some of those layers a little bit. And if you see little tiny kind of squiggly critters running around really fast, they'll be sort of a palish, maybe orangish color, yellowish, orangish color. And they look like just little tiny lines. They're very, very tiny. Then that's usually your issue is thrips. And they will spread very quickly to all of your other plants. Yeah, you got to intercept or intervene yeah. quickly with them. And given that they will spread other fungal diseases and viruses too, then you definitely don't want them moving around your collection. Yeah, I've heard such horror stories about thrips. Let's do real quick. I know the last but not least aphids. We've talked about that a lot. I mean, I know people outdoors are getting aphids a lot. I feel like you don't see aphids as much with houseplants, but are they a similar to mealybug style bug? How would you handle aphids? 
Aphids are actually the least worrisome problem for me. And, you know, we might want to jump to whiteflies too, because okay. I think that that's going to be one that is still a biggie for people. But aphids would be sort of the easiest to deal with on my list. They have cycles that sort of come very quickly and are very short. When you deal with aphids outside in the garden, it's usually very early spring when temperatures are still cool, but things are getting humid, right? It's starting to warm up, Mm -hmm. but it's humid or you get, it's whatever your rainy season is. That's when all of a sudden it'll be like aphids have come out of nowhere and they'll kind of blow up. Usually in the indoor environment, aphids are going to be more of a problem with you on edible crops. Okay. That you're you're kind of growing in controlled environments. So, you know, you certainly can have um, aphids. You aren't going to see aphids as commonly on your standard houseplants. But if you grow pepper plants inside or lettuce or tomatoes or anything like that, then those tend to be more common, you know, host plants indoors for aphids. But aphids... It's very easy to kill those with a hard water blast. It sort of rips them away from their feeding tube, which is kind of gross, but it it kills them. Um, so taking that plant outside and just doing a, a hard water blast on it or as hard as you can without damaging the plant tissue is just a great way to get rid of most of the aphids. Follow up with an insecticidal soap treatment. Do that again in seven to 10 days and you can usually knock out your aphid infestation. Now, if you're growing in enclosed grow tents, then you're just going to have to keep up that regimen. Mm, okay. Because they can tend to just keep breaking out unless you get every egg, right? Which could be tough to do. So in a tight and enclosed a grow tent or an indoor greenhouse that you have closed up in plastic, those are going to be spots where any of these pests can kind of blow up. But a hard water blast, insecticidal soap, horticultural oils work great, spinosad, That's really all you have to do for aphids. And as long as you follow up once or twice at seven to 10 day intervals, you can usually knock aphids out pretty good. Okay, cool. And I know we're getting close to the hour, but you mentioned white flies. What do we need to know about white flies? Yeah, white flies are one of your nemesis and and they can be a problem inside too. The great thing about white flies is that they're very easy to spot. Yeah, man. They are little white flies that will fly around and... When you bump the plant or shake it, all of a sudden you get a cloud of these little Mm -hmm. white flies. So when you see that, you know, the larva and the nymphs will suck the sap out of your plant. So it's not the adults that are really causing the problem. It's the larva and the nymphs, like your fungus gnats, right? You will get kind of similar to spider mites because the the white flies will, you know, congregate. They're generally going to be underside of the leaves. You'll get that mottled, speckled appearance with yellowing on top of the leaves, they start to drop overall reduced growth and vigor. And you also will get a sticky honeydew with white flies potentially followed by a a mold. So your sticky traps are a great first tool for dealing with the adults. Insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils work well. So that's usually as far as you need to go in terms of insecticides to deal with that. The biopesticides too, you can also use those. You know, talking to you about this is making me also realize, which is something I think I wish I did earlier. You know, when you get a pest outbreak, the last thing you want to do is be scrambling for sticky traps or scrambling for a lens. As a plant parent, it's a really good idea to have a few of these things on hand in wherever you keep your pots and your plants so that the minute you see an outbreak, you can dive in. I've never kept those sticky traps in my home, but this conversation is inspiring me to like order some and just keep them where I store all my pots. So the next time I see an infestation, I could pop those in immediately just to even help with the ID. If you're anything like me, you keep lots of Band-Aids and Neosporin in the kitchen. So why would you not do the same for your plants? I recommend having a little first aid kit, have some sticky traps, have at a minimum some insecticidal soap maybe some horticultural oil, some rubber gloves that you can use to clean, something like that, because the sticky traps I always have on hand. I always have a back stock of sticky traps. I always have some hydrogen peroxide. I have some insecticidal soap and I have some horticultural oil. Even just having those on hand can help you take immediate action until you can really diagnose what you have going on and maybe see if you need to do something that's stronger. I love this idea of a plant first aid kit. I'm totally going to build one for myself. And I like the idea of having the rubber gloves there too, because 
so many times I've just gone and like done the scale with a paper towel, but like then I feel like I have scale like under my fingernails, even though I don't because I use the paper towel. But like I like the idea of just having a little plant first aid kit. I think this is adorable. And I'm going to build it out in the show notes for people if you yeah. need it. What about homemade pest control remedies? Yeah. So there's lots of recipes online. And I think probably the one that most people default to is, okay, insecticidal soap. Great. I'm just going to get some dishwashing soap and put it in some water and spray my plants. But dish soap does not have the same ingredients that an actual insecticidal soap is going to have. Plus it's got dyes and other stuff in it. So I recommend buying an insecticidal soap, but if you're going to make your own, you need to use actual real Castile soap, which is vegetable soap, which has like olive oil and lye and water. So if you're going to do that, use a real Castile soap. The other kind of homemade mixture that you might do is called Bordeaux mixture. That's really going to be more of a fungicide. So maybe we talk about that in a later episode about plant diseases. But generally speaking, don't take the dish soap and mix it with water and use that as insecticidal soap. If you're going to DIY, then make sure you're using a pure Castile soap okay. to make your own insecticidal soap. So just be mindful of the ingredients that you're actually mixing together to make sure that they're efficacious and that you're not just putting something that could just be too harsh and not effective on the insects that you're dealing with. I also feel like with a lot of this homemade stuff, so much of this stuff is so affordable. It's like, if there's something that's super expensive, I get trying to make it on your own and like being scrappy, but you also have to like pick and choose where you want to do that. And I feel like when you have a pest outbreak, you don't want to be like making something that isn't going to work for your plants and then just making the pest outbreak worse. Like I feel like you have to pick and choose when you want to be scrappy and when you want to. And I, I totally believe in that. But I do feel like there's a time and place for it. And this isn't it. <laughs> well, and there's a lot of, you know, things like you said to get rid of fungus gnats, oh, you know, use cinnamon or, you know, things like that. And you you need to follow the research. You know, something like cinnamon isn't just going to knock out a pest outbreak. It's not going to knock out, cure necessarily a fungal disease or root rot. You know, it may have minor effects on the rhizosphere in terms of making it slightly more, less hospitable for fungal reproduction, but it doesn't mean that it's actually going to cure it. So you you actually have to look at the research on some of these DIY home ingredients to make sure that they actually work before you waste really good cinnamon instead of keeping it for your French toast. <laughs> yeah, go we'll make some French toast. Last but not least, when do I call it? And I feel like I had to ask you this last time too, but like when is a plant past the point of no return with an insect or arachnid outbreak? I think for your listeners, the best way to define that is when that plant is no longer bringing you joy. <laughs> 100%. When it's causing you more stress than it is happiness, you're dealing with an ongoing pest infestation. If it is spreading to your other plants, I mean, there is a point in time at which, look, I have gotten rid of a number of citrus plants when the scale or, or for clients, you know, when the scale has just become too difficult you would have to use a systemic, which makes growing the citrus pointless because you can't eat the citrus if it were ever to actually make any, if it rebounded from, you know, the infestation. So is it bringing you joy? Does the plant look so terrible that you just don't want to look at it anymore? There is a point of no return, right? Like I said, when you have highly damaged foliage and tissue from sucking insects, you know, that tissue itself is not going to regenerate. Sometimes the best thing to do is maybe cut that plant all the way back. Get rid, throw a bag up, throw away that foliage that's infested and just start as clean as you can. Now, bacterial diseases and, and viruses, which we can talk about in another episode, that's a different story. And there's a quicker point in the timeline where that's got to go because you can't recover from some of those things. But with a pest issue, if you're just tired of dealing with it and that plant never looks good, no matter what you do, 
pitch it in the compost and start clean. Set it free, baby. Start clean. Yeah. I absolve you of your green guilt. Just grow new plants. <laughs> and the other thing too, it's like, say you have a scale infestation, not unlike a citrus, but like, you know, Raffi, my Raffidophora has scale, which for me at this moment, it's not worth pitching him because he's my child and it's not that big of a deal. It's like not that bad of an outbreak. But you can also propagate a plant. Like if the infestation is too far on half the plant, you can also, you know, I mean, I know propagating a plant that like is under pest attack, maybe not the best idea, but I feel like there are also other ways that you, you know, if you really want to try and save the plant, like maybe like giving it a good dunk and maybe propagating it, is that a good idea or no? Was that a bad idea? Well, you want to be careful that whatever tissue that you're taking as a cutting doesn't have eggs or juveniles hiding in it somewhere. And, and you may not be able to confirm that. So that's certainly something you can try. Take that cutting, dunk it in a solution of insecticidal soap or horticultural oil, let it cure, stick it. You could certainly try treating it right before you reproduce it. But I would isolate that cutting. So, you know, that's the thing is that, you know, it may need a quarantine zone. So if you're dealing with a persistent pest issue, you shouldn't leave that plant mixed in with the rest of your collection. It needs to be quarantined. So it needs to go outside. That can be tricky. And, and most of us don't really have space to properly quarantine an infested plant in our home such that it's far enough away, especially if you're dealing with flying insects, if you're dealing with thrips, if you're dealing with fungus nuts, if you're dealing with white flies or any other jumping insect, that can be tough to do. So typically I don't recommend propagating a plant with an infestation unless you go through some pretty extreme steps to sanitize the new cutting as best you can, but then just be prepared that it could have some hitchhikers. To wreak more havoc. Yeah. Forget I suggested that. We'll keep it in the episode, but so we could get your answer. But forget, don't take that advice, plant friends. <laughs> Listen to Leslie. This is why I have her on the podcast. <laughs> There's lots of new plant babies out there looking for a home. Exactly. So sometimes it's better to just start fresh. Exactly. I love that. I love that every episode at the end of every single one of these episodes is just going to be like a therapy moment of being like, it's okay to let go if you need to let go. You're still worthy. <laughs> but okay, well, you're the best, Leslie. This was so helpful. I, I really feel like this is going to help so many plant parents in need. I'm totally going to go order my plant first aid kit right now. And I'll put the links in the show notes for anybody else who wants to participate in that. I'm because, you know, they make those sticky traps now that are coming like cute shapes. They're not just all the ugly yellow. They make cute sticky traps now. So I have cute ones. I have ones that are shaped like flowers and I, I have cute little shapes. Yeah, I'm going to do some research. The standard ones we use, you know, in the industry are the cards, you know, they're just like a three by five card and you hang them, you know, with little twisty ties all over and they're not the most attractive thing, but you, they do make them now with like a little plant steak shape at the bottom so that you could just stick it in the bottom of your pot. Of course, if you have taller plants, you're going to want to try to put a couple a little bit higher to catch the flying insects, but yeah, they make stylish little yellow sticky traps now. Yes. I will do some research plant friends and have links for you in the show notes. Put your magnifying glass in there. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. I've used that thing so many times. <laughs> Leslie, this is so fun. I can't wait to have you back. So the next one we're going to do is diseases. Oh boy. Because pests is one part of the game, but diseases is a whole nother part of the game. That's so a whole nother thing. Stay subscribed, plant friends. And Leslie, where can everyone find you if you want to go nerd out, read Leslie's books, follow her on Instagram, by her incredible botanical art. Leslie, where are you at? You can find me at leslihalleck.com at my central hub there. I'm on Instagram at Leslie Halleck. You can find my books, Gardening Under Lights, Plant Parenting, Tiny Plants, anywhere you buy books, online, Amazon, you name it. Uh, or you can order signed copies through me in my web shop. And yes, I am also artsy fartsy. So you can look at my botanical art there too. At yes. If you guys follow me on Instagram and you see my, or you watch 
videos of my podcast and you see my background, I have a new background with Leslie's art. She made me amazing Monstera and also this like incredible aeroid print and an orchid. Leslie, it's so good. So go, go check Leslie's art out because she's like the perfect mix of plant nerd and artist. (laughs) It's amazing. I love you, Maria. I love you too. (laughs) Until next time. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Thank you so much, Leslie. I love this Grow Better series we have her doing. I love the thought that we're kind of calling it Grow Better because it can go so many different ways, but she's so knowledgeable. And when I need the big guns, when I need to call in the big guns to talk about plant pests or to talk about plant disease that, you know, a normal hobbyist can't speak to, I'm so lucky that she agrees to come on the show and talk to me and talk to you. So I hope this was helpful. Earmark this episode. You're going to want to come back. I have put together the little Amazon storefront of this houseplant for its first aid kit that Leslie and I were talking about. It's going to grow. You can certainly find the recommended products that, you know, we talked about, but I think we might even do a whole episode on it in the future because it really got me and her talking about how important it is for us to understand what neem oil is, what horticultural oil is. So make sure you're subscribed. She's coming back to do an episode on diseases. We're probably going to do an episode on this, you know, safety on this first aid kit. We've got a bunch of ideas. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast because Leslie's amazing, but we also have so many other podcasts with amazing guests lined up. I cannot wait to share them with you. Happy 200 plant friends. Thank you so much. Thank you for being along for the ride with me. Whether you've been an OG listener and you've been listening for five years, whether you're a new listener and you're working through the back catalog of episodes and tuning in every week, it means so much to me that, you know, in the scheme of all the millions of podcasts out there, you choose to come and hang out with me. Oh boy, oh boy. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. I hope this episode helps. I hope you spend some fabulous time with your plants this week. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.